Hello folks, it's good to have you back with us again tonight. Uh, this is Bethel Baptist Church in Vilas, North Carolina. I want to encourage you again to have your Bible with you this evening, and I want to welcome all of you that are listening in with us tonight. Others will be tuning in and turning on here in a little bit, but uh, thank you for joining us. Last Sunday at our Sunday morning service out at the park, which is also uh, uh, on Facebook and YouTube, um, I read one of the prayers out of a little book. It's called Praying for Our Nation, Scriptural Prayers to Revive Our Country. And these are so appropriate for the days and times that we're in right now. But the amazing thing about this little book, it was written in, in uh, 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 1999, uh, 21 years ago. And uh, But it's so appropriate for today. So I'd like to start out, it, this is uh, the person that wrote this is Mary Washington, George Washington's mother. Remember that God is our only sure trust. Dear Father, I come to you in the mighty name of Jesus, thanking you and praising you for our great nation. I thank you for the plan you gave to our forefathers by which to govern our nation and for the division of powers so that our destiny does not rest in the hands of one person. In praying for those in authority, I therefore lift up our Congress, both the House and of Representatives and the Senate. I pray that by your power our legislative body would make laws that are just. Father, I ask you to give them wisdom to make decisions that would strengthen and prosper our nation. I desire that they would make right decisions concerning the politics, the social welfare, and the economics of our nation. I pray that you would cause Congress to be, motiva to be motivated more by your hand than by partisan or personal concerns. Remember that God is our only sure trust. Mary Washington, George Washington's mother. Well, uh, we're all praying, I know, and, uh, and lifting up our nation, our country, and our leaders in government, our president, and our Congress of the United States, the Supreme Court of our land, the governors of our states, the mayors of our city, uh, cities, and the police officers, and the sheriff's deputies, our first responders, our doctors and nurses, and all of those people who sacrifice daily for our lives, let's be sure, folks, and keep them in our prayers. And I want to encourage and remind every one of you, if you're not registered to vote, please get registered and vote. Uh, God's people need to be voting and need to be expressing our uh, choices and those decisions that God has put upon our hearts. So I encourage every one of you, if you're not already registered, Get registered, and let's all be sure to vote when it's time. I want to invite you to take your Bibles tonight and uh, turn with me over to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16 and down in verse 13 through 17. We started uh, Sunday morning on our study of discipleship. We spent about six weeks on the subject of prayer, and then a few weeks as we talked about fellowship and the life of God's people, our fellowship in the Lord and in the church of Jesus Christ. I believe that uh, so important that while we're praying for our family members, guys, that we pray for the relationships of our children, the friendships, the relationships, the fellowships that we're involved in, that they are good and wholesome and godly. But uh, tonight, we're going to pick up where we left off on Sunday morning. We were talking about discipleship and how Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4, and uh, he, he, he was calling his disciples. But I wanted to jump over to uh, chapter 16 and read something here. It says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And his disciples said and answered him, Some say that you are John the Baptist, some that you're Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And Jesus said unto them, But who do you say that I am? 
And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal that unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Now guys, I am convinced that God is the one who uh, reveals to us spiritual truth. It is God that touches our heart and that opens our heart. There's a uh, verse over in, in Acts chapter 16. I didn't write this down for our uh, folks here, but I was just looking at it today. And Acts chapter 16 and uh, down in verse 14 is talking about Lydia. Paul and Silas had gone down to a prayer meeting on the river, uh, on the outskirts of town, uh, to a little prayer meeting. And in verse 14 it says, And a certain woman named Lydia, who was a seller of purple, she was a businesswoman, from the city of Thyatira, worshiped God, uh, and she heard us whose heart the Lord opened so that she attended uh, unto the things which were spoken of uh, of Paul. And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Now, I, I always think about that verse about how God is the one that opens up people's hearts and minds. Sunday morning we were talking about how Jesus, when he first came out of the wilderness from being tempted of Satan for 40 days and 40 nights, he immediately came out and he called Andrew and Simon Peter to follow him. And then in the next verses there in Matthew 4, he called uh, James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And in both of those cases, those those guys were brothers and and. Uh, and in both of those cases, they immediately left their boat, they left their fishing nets, and they followed Jesus. And so we were talking about the call of discipleship. And, uh, and, and not everybody that Jesus called really believed in him. As a matter of fact, uh, there were several people along the way that quit and left, and, and Jesus said they were not of us because if they had had been of us, they would not have left us. But uh, I want to tell you, there are some things that accompany discipleship, and for those of us that are studying right now here at, at our church, we're, we're studying seven of the most basic and important principles of what it means to follow Jesus Christ, and the, the things that are so absolutely important in our lives as Christians. And so we talked, started out on prayer, then we were on fellowship for a few weeks, and now we're on discipleship. So I want us to look together and uh, turn back, if you would, to uh, uh, the, um, let's, let's go back to uh, Matthew uh, chapter 4. And we were talking the other day, Matthew 4 and 5, Jesus was calling his disciples these disciples left everything the moment Jesus called them. They followed him, left their nets, left their boats, left their family members. And then in Matthew 5, the disciples started, uh, began listening and, and to the teaching of Jesus because he took them in the mountain there. Uh, and we have for uh, three chapters there, we have the uh, Sermon on the Mount that Jesus went up in, into the mountain there. It says in chapter 5 and verse 1, Seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was said, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them. And there's where we got into the Beatitudes Sunday morning. Well, let me just kind of pick up there. And, it, and the disciples followed him. The Bible says in chapter 4 and verse 23, they followed him all over Galilee. Now, following Jesus, we don't know where we're going to go. We don't know where we're going to go. We don't know where the Lord's going to take us in our life. And, and we come to the Lord just like we are. That old hymn that we sing at our invitation time so often in churches, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Now, many of us have been called 
to be disciples of Jesus Christ. And guys, this, this, this encompasses a lot of things that are very important in our life. So I want to, uh, if there's something that sparks you, uh, touches you as we're going through, write, get a piece of paper and a pen and write some of these things down that will help you. But they followed him everywhere he went. They listened to him preaching, the Bible says, in verses 23 through 25. Uh, Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people Jesus was unique and special in this he always healed everybody he didn't heal somebody and then pass over others but he healed everybody they listened to him preaching and in Matthew five thirteen, Jesus called his followers he said he said, guys, there's two things I'm going to tell you that, 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 that I see who you are. He said, you are the salt of the earth in Matthew 5, 13. And in Matthew 5, 14, he said, you are the light of the world. What I didn't go into on Sunday morning and, and where I want to pick up is where Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. He went on to say, but if the salt... You know, if you leave salt open or you pour it out and it's exposed to the elements, uh, it loses its taste. It loses its savor. And that's what Jesus said. He said, you're the salt of the earth, but if the, if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? How, how are you going to salt salt? How are you going to make it saltier? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under the foot of men. Jesus said, I've called you to be the salt of the earth, but you cannot lose your savor. You cannot lose the freshness in your life of your relationship with me, and you're going to have to stick with me and follow me. And then he said in verse 14, he said, you are the light of the world. And then he made a comparison to their lives. He said, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. That means if your light's shining and you're up on a hill, you won't be hidden. But he said neither, verse 15, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but they put it on a candlestick and it gives light unto all that are in the house. Jesus was saying there, our light was given to us so that we would let it shine. Uh, we all know that little chorus probably grew up as kids singing that song, This Little Light of Mine. I'm going to let it shine. And that's what Jesus said. Let your light, verse 16, so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So he talks about us being the salt of the earth and if we're a disciple of Christ, we are the light of the world. And there are some decisions and commitments that accompany discipleship. Now, you may be in a, involved in a small group fellowship. You may be involved in a, a Sunday school class or a Bible study group. And there, you've got a, a smaller group than, uh, than what would be normal. But uh, you, you have a smaller group and you're in there and you're studying the decision and, and commitment and what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Well, I noticed four things in this text that, uh, that uh, Jesus began to uh, help the disciples with some of their choices, some of their decisions, and some of their commitments that accompany discipleship. Now, there are some things that Jesus uh, just assumes that you're doing because he doesn't say if you pray or if you fast but Jesus said when you pray or when you fast or he starts off in Matthew chapter 6 and down in verses 1 through 4 let's look at that Jesus starts off by talking about giving alms now alms is an old old King James word and uh uh, a lot of people get this mixed up because the Bible in the Old Testament and the New Testament talks about tithing. But almsgiving is not tithing. It's not your tithe that you give to the Lord. In Mal Malachi chapter 3, God's talking about the tithe. And uh, I believe the tithe, the tithe was not just under the law, but the Bible says that uh, Abraham 
paid tithes to Melchizedek, the great high priest, back in the early, early chapters of the book of Genesis. But that was a long time before the Mosaic law was ever formed. And then Moses taught tithing under the law. And then Jesus said, talked about tithing in the New Testament after the law. And churches have been built around the world and ministries carried on by the principle that Jesus and God the Father gave us with the creation of the world. Two, two main principles. Number one, God says, I made six days for you and I gave you a seventh day so that you could give one whole day back to me. And they call that the Sabbath day. The principle is, Jesus said in the New Testament, Jesus said, Whatever day is it, you set aside as the Lord's day, you give that day. Uh, he said the Sabbath uh, was not made, uh, man was not made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And so God says, one of the principles about that I have given to you is one-seventh of your time. One-seventh. Now, all of our time belongs to God, and all of our money belongs to God. But God says, I want you to give me back one-seventh of your time, one day out of seven. And God says, I want you to give back to me one-tenth of everything that I give you. I want to give you another a tenth that you have that you can bring as a gift, a worship gift to me. And so God set to establish those two principles. And guys, I want to tell you, God doesn't want you and me in his church robbing him of his time. Paul, uh, the writer of Hebrews said in, in Hebrews 10.25 not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. God says I've given you seven days now six days are for you to labor, work, do whatever you want to do but on the seventh day that's a day that is special between you and me and so God says the same thing with our, our funds. Look what he says here verse 16 Matthew 6.16 6, moreover when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces. So Jesus talked there about when you fast. Let, oh, well, let's go back up to the first of Matthew six, verses one through four. Take heed that you do not take uh, do not your alms before men to be seen of them. Mm -hmm. Alms giving is money that is given to the poor, to charity, to help hungry people, to help the homeless, to help the needy. Take heed that you do not give your alms before men to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, verse 2, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when you do alms, when you are giving alms to the poor and all, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth. God is just, that's his way of expressing the way he wants you and me to give to the poor. That's not the giving of the tithe because our right hand does know what the left hand is doing there. But when you're giving to the poor, he said, look, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which sees in secret himself shall reward thee openly. So we go on down to verse 5, and then he says, Now, not if you pray. He said, But when you pray, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which sees in secret shall reward thee openly. And when you pray, don't use, don't be like the heathen do. They use vain repetitions. They say the same thing over and over and over and over again. That's what the heathen do, Jesus said, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knows what things you have need of before you ask him. And then he gives what we call the Lord's Prayer. It's really the, the disciples' prayer, Jesus teaching the disciples about prayer. But then let's go down to verse uh, 16 
And Jesus talks about fasting. Je Notice again, disciples, Jesus didn't say when you fast or if, if you fast. Jesus said, moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites with a sad, sad countenance. When you're out there fasting, you're going to do a little fast and all, and you you don't put any makeup on that day, ladies or men. You don't shake. You just want to look scraggly and all. You just oh, I'm just I can hardly make it. I'm I'm on a fast right now. I'm praying to God. I'm fasting. No, he said, don't do it that way. When you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But you, thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head, wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Now, guys, I know these are simple, 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 simple things. God is saying when you give your alms, when you're giving to the poor, that's the work of a disciple. That's what we do as disciples of Christ. When you pray, he said, uh, it's not if you pray, it's when you pray. God is assuming his people who are his disciples are going to be spending time in prayer. When you fast, guys, we need to fast, and we need to fast and pray. And then he says, when you, uh, la the last thing down there, when you establish your life's priorities. Look in chapter 6 and down in verse 19. Now, disciples have to have disciplines, okay? You can't be a disciple without having any self-discipline. And so here, listen to this now that Jesus is talking about. This is very good. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So let me tell you what uh, Jesus is talking about. Jesus said, as my disciples, I want you to establish your life's priorities. I want you to build and shape the goals and the the uh, priorities that you know are going to be pleasing to me and the things that I am teaching you, I want these things to be the top priorities in your life. So in verse 19 through 21, he talks about where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It needs to be our priority. Guys, we all want to work. We all want to make a living. We all want to earn a good living. But we don't want to. We don't let want to let our earthly treasures dictate where we live, what we do, where we go, our happiness, the happiness of our families. God wants us to establish that uh, that our our treasures are are in the Lord. Our treasures are in serving Him. And so uh, then, uh, who is your master? Jesus said down in verse twenty four. He said, "No man can serve two masters." For either he will hate the one master and love the other, or else he will hold to the one master and despise the other. And then Jesus says, you cannot serve God and mammon. That's the wealth of the world. He said, you, you can't be a person who's serving the Lord and be serving the world at the same time. Well, what about the necessities of life, the things that we all have to have? We all have to have food. We all, my goodness, we all have to feed our kids and our fa ourselves. What about the necessities of life? Jesus said in, in uh, Matthew 6, 25, Jesus said, I, what, the first thing I want to tell you, don't worry about it. Don't go around worrying about what you're going to eat and what you're going to wear. Let's pick up verse 25. Therefore, Jesus said, I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not your life more than meat, and your body more than clothing or raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. And yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought or worrying about it, 
can add one cubit to his stature, his height. Who can make yourself taller just by worrying about it? Verse 28. And why take ye thought for your clothing, raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, say, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things did the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. Well, what are we supposed to do then? Well, the last thing there, number five, he, he says, I want you to put God first. Put the Lord first in your life. Uh, uh, verse 33, but seek ye first. This is first priority, top priority. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then look what Jesus says. This is a promise from him, guys. All these things shall be added unto you. Guys, can I tell you today, when you put God first in your life, when you put God first in your marriage, when you put God first in your home with your children, when you put God first in your church, when you put God first in your priorities of things that you're going to do, be doing with your time, when you put God first in what did he say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these other things shall be added unto you. Well, there are seven, seven things. I'm going to close off with these seven things for every disciple of Jesus Christ to trust God for in your life. I've got these jotted down here, but I just want to run through them so you get it. Number one, trust God for all of his promises to you in his word. Trust God Trust the promises of God. He will not fail you, and the promises of God will not fail you. I love that little chorus that says, every, every promise in the book is mine. Every chapter, every verse, every line. All the fullness of his love sublime. Every promise in the book is mine. And so trust God for all of his promises to you in his word. Secondly, trust God for his presence with you always. Hebrews 13, 5 says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. There's never going to be a time. No, there'll never be a place you will go where God is not there with you. That's a promise of God. And his presence is always with us. Number three, trust God for the plans that he has for your life. You know, I always tell young people, God reserves the very best in life for those who leave the choices up to him. Over in the Old Testament book of Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, God says this, For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. God says, I've got great plans for your life. And guys, the only way you're going to experience those great plans is by keeping God's plans and God's priorities in your plans that you're doing. Number four, trust God for his protection in your life. I love that verse in the Old Testament book of Job, Job chapter 1, verse 9 and 10. The God and the devil are talking together and, and God's asking the devil, he said, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him in all the earth. And uh, the devil answers God back and he said, God, I guess Job does love you because you put a hedge around him and I can't get to him. And I tell our people all the time, I, I, that's the kind of hedge I pray for around my wife and children, my grandchildren, my church family here my loved ones, all of our missionaries that we support every day. My prayer is, oh God, would you put your protective hedge around each and every one of these that I'm praying for today, God. I want, the, I want that same hedge, God, you put around Job and all of his family. And Satan could not touch Job or his children, God, until you ran it by your desk 
and you approved and you you let you took down the hedge momentarily but God we know God loves us and that God is the one who protects us and keeps us all right number five trust God for his power over in Ephesians over in Ephesians chapter 3 I want to read this one to you uh, I think it, Michaela may be putting it up on the screen there but uh, let me read it to you out of my Bible Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to his power that works in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. God, I will tell you, we serve a powerful and an awesome God. The old songwriter said it is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. With arms wide open, he'll pardon you. It is no secret what God can do. He is a God who made the heavens and the earth and everything in this world, ladies and gentlemen. He is a God of all power. And number six, trust God for his provision. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 19, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Another little chorus we used to sing as children, He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, the wealth of every mine. He owns the rivers and the rocks and rills, the sun and stars that shine. Wonderful riches more than tongue can tell. He is my father, so they're mine as well. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and I know that he will care for me. We can trust God for his provision in our life. The psalmist said, I have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. And last of all, number seven, we can trust God for his peace, the peace that God gives us in our heart, and in our mind. And listen, as disciples of Christ, we need every one of these. Trust God for his promises. Trust God for his presence. Trust God for his plans. Trust God for his protection. Trust God for his power. Trust God for his provision. And trust God for his peace. There is a peace. The old hymn says, There is a peace in my heart that the world never gave. A peace it cannot take away. Though the trials of life may surround like a cloud, I have a peace that has come here to stay. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 6, and 7 that God has given his peace to his kids. Disciples of Christ, let's realize that when we became a follower, there are disciplines that go with discipleship. And you and I, it doesn't have to be if we do this, if we do that, if we're serving God, if we go to church, if we tithe, if we... No, it is not if. God says, when you do it, here's the way I want you to do it. So he not only spells out what our priorities need to be, but he tells us he wants those things to be the top priorities. Disciples of Jesus Christ, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those of you who believe truly that he is the Son of God. I want to call you to the disciplines of discipleship and to the commitment to being a disciple and following Him, uh, leaving the things of the world behind and fastening your eyes on Jesus Christ. Go where He sends you. Say what He tells you. Uh, do what He wants you to do. You're a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. Let's close in just a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word tonight. God, I pray for those who really want to commit their lives to you to be followers and true disciples of you, Lord Jesus. Bless us with wisdom and grace. And God, thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. We can come to you and call out to you, O oh God, when we have fallen, God, we have slipped, we have sinned. God, and we can say, oh Lord, forgive me of my sins. And you have said, Lord, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Keep us close to your side and your heart, Lord Jesus. I pray in his precious name.
Amen. God bless you and thank you for being with us tonight.